so we started talking about um, you know RT PCR for uh, making the diagnosis, um, and started talking about the sensitivity. Jorge, can you tell us a little bit more about this uh, assay and um, the level of sensitivity that is needed for monitoring uh, patients uh, today? Yeah. So there's there's uh, you know a few important things to remember about the PCR. Um, Number one, um, both, both you and Mike have, have mentioned that this is something that you can do and correlates very well between blood and bone marrow, so that therefore becomes very useful, particularly for follow-up, because you can do it in the peripheral blood and it works well, so that's important. Uh, number two is that we need to remember that this is a test that is a ratio. It's a ratio of the abnormal gene of the PCR able to a control gene. Um, so uh, part of the difficulty sometimes with uh, a proper sample is that the laboratory has been has to be able to, uh, to 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 measure a certain number of copies of the control gene to determine that that sample is adequate um, if they cannot um, detect this, that number of of, uh, of copies it's either not the sample may not be adequate at all um, or it may not be um, able to detect a deep enough response so, for example, if you only detect, let's say, you know, 10,000 copies of the control gene, well, that, that PCR is only good to four logs, and it's not able to go any deeper. So, that is some, unfortunately, that's information that's not always available from the lab and makes the interpretations a little bit difficult. Um, but we need to understand there is variability between the... the the, 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 the sensitivity and the, and this is also from sample to sample in the same laboratory from the same patient one sample may be able to detect different levels so so that's something that's uh, that's important um, another important thing is we talked about the levels um, at baseline <clears throat> the different control genes uh, may give you may, may be useful in different ways at, at baseline and uh, in the U.S., um, I, I don't know what you use in your in your in your institutions, uh, but most laboratories use ABLE as a control gene, and and that one gives a a, a baseline level that is not very uh, appropriate for for calculations of, of decline and, and things like that because the ABLE control gene uh, also detects the BCR ABLE. So, so you can get values that are not accurate. Actually, you can get values that are above 100% because of that, you know, misamplification. Now, it is important to do it, as you mentioned earlier, because you at least know that you can detect it and, and it gives you that ability versus one of the atypical transcripts, but the value itself doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, tell you much. The, um, uh, when you use other control genes, then you are able to have a more accurate representation, and then you can calculate slopes from the beginning to three months and things like that that can be predictive of long-term outcome, uh, et cetera. So, um, but, but it is important that uh, because we are more and more interested in, to, in, in getting to these deeper molecular responses, um, that we make sure that it's a laboratory that, that, is, that, that has that good sensitivity, those good quality controls, and let's not forget that uh, international standardization is not the only thing that matters for a lab. You can standardize the tests, but still have a poor sample quality. And that sometimes is not on the, con the control of the, of the laboratory even. You know, it, it sometimes the, 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 the DNA degrades in, in transit and you know, things like that. So uh, it's not necessarily a, a technical issue, it's just, it's just part of the test. So, um, so, so a, a lot of, the, uh, of variability, sometimes difficult to assess for, for the clinician, for, for any of us, uh, but, but always keep in mind uh, this. And the other thing that I think is important to remember, there's a coefficient of variability, and even in the best labs, the, there is some variability in the test. Therefore, we, um, I, 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 I think I can speak for all of us that we never act on one sample that has a, a, a different value because there is variability. There is a coefficient of variability that you always want to confirm and look at trends and look at, uh, at changes rather than just one individual sample and react in one way or another, uh, uh, understanding that, that, that these can be just variations or, uh, along a certain number. The only, other, the only other thing I would add is, is maybe to try to have patients go um, consistently to uh, one laboratory right. because that then 
removes the variability between laboratories because they're all aiming, as Jorge just said, to the international standard. They're correcting. They're trying to aim for an international standard value, but there's variability there so, too. So let's come back to that point because, uh, as, as you know, as we go through this um, segment today, we're going to be talking about uh, some of the new data regarding treatment-free remissions. And that's um, with that as a potential goal for patients, I think it becomes even more critical when you're treating a patient, making sure that you're getting good quality data uh, right from the start. And, you know, you're right about the ABLE control. I mean, a, a, a laboratory that you can trust the, will tell you how many copies of the ABLE control were in the sample because that gives them some idea of whether the sample was degraded. If you don't see enough of the ABLE control, then there might be a problem with just the sample integrity. So all of these things are very important and because we are busy clinicians and not scientists, we need to put that in the hands of a laboratory that has this test um, well validated there um, and um, can measure um, to measure down to a level that is clinically important for us. And I think that's another thing we're going to talk about as we go along talking about um, initial therapy. What are the clinically important levels of uh, response to ensure long-term survival? But now we have a new thing that we're going to be talking about in terms of treatment-free remission, and you, need, you clearly need deeper levels um, to, to do that. So you need, as you said, from the start, you know, a laboratory that a patient is going to. And, and unfortunately for patients and for clinicians, we don't always have control over that. But I think we need to start taking control and speak for our patients. I think, you know, our, um, our hospital administrators need to understand from us the importance of not switching between laboratories based on what, you know, reimbursement or what cost uh, deal they could get this year versus next year. Uh, with, with all of that, um, how do we know that the outcomes with ABLE tyrosine kinase inhibitors actually improved? Which randomized trial showed us that? Oh, well, we've had a steady stream. Uh, I mean, the CML story has changed basically entirely in, the last, in our careers in the last 10, 10, 15 years. We just saw a publication of long-term data from the IRIS trial showing us that TKIs were, you know, the prototype drug imatinib was vastly superior to interferon with, with, it, with cytarabine if patients could receive it. That, uh, the survival of patients is dramatically different. The natural history of CML has changed. As you're mentioning, it's a, it's a whole new world, the treatment-free remission. Um, and it's just built from there. You know, we, we obviously saw the gaps with imantinib that not all patients responded to the resistance or, you know, in some cases, intolerance was an issue. And fortunately, our, in par our industry partners came up with second-generation inhibitors. Nalantinib um, has shown um, tremendous activity both in, in the second and, and now in the first line and has really taken us to the, to the end zone with treatment-free remission. Uh, desantinib and, and, and so on. So, so I think um, the outlook for a CML patient now is just dramatically different. There's, there should have a normal lifespan expected no matter what their age, if things go well and we handle it properly. So it's a great story. 